All right, Kevin, we are seeing your screen. All right, uh, thanks, Chip, for the introduction. And thanks to the council for the opportunity to be here today to share some of our recent research on red snapper feeding here in the Southeast. There are many reasons why studying the diets of fishes is important. Just by knowing what fish eat, we can learn a lot about how fish are using different habitats and transferring energy among those habitats throughout their life. Um, for example, how energy might flow from inshore oyster beds to offshore reefs as juveniles grow, or how fish might move around a smaller area to either capture prey or avoid predators, or even migrate uh, between different habitats seasonally. We can gain a broader uh, understanding of basic ecological interactions and not just who is eating who and how much of each, um, but also what level of resource overlap may exist among different predators and whether there may be a competition for limited resources, which has been shown to be a major component of density dependent mortality in fishes. We can determine which prey species are most important to a particular predator and may be a limiting resource for population growth. For example, in our region, bullet and frigate mackerel were found to be an extremely important prey for both dolphin and wahoo and are now managed as ecosystem components in the dolphin and wahoo FMP. On the other hand, knowing how often and how much of a certain prey species is eaten by other predators can improve natural mortality estimates for managed species, which is also really important since predation rates actually exceed fishing mortality rates in many cases. Diet information is a critical need for a more holistic approach to fisheries management called ecosystem-based fisheries management or EBFM. And there's been a lot of work done recently to develop the tools to utilize EBFM in our region. And we at SCDNR are excited to have been able to play a part. Um, for example, along with the council's habitat and ecosystems advisory panel, we provided a lot of data and writing assistance to the recently updated uh, ecosystem plan, fishery ecosystem plan, that includes um, a great resource on food webs and connectivity in the region. You should definitely check it out. We also helped uh, to fill in a lot of data gaps for an ecosystem modeling system called Ecopath with Ecosim. And this model um, can simulate ecosystem level responses to kind of varying levels of predator or prey abundance. And we'll hopefully be able to make predictions about the effects of potential fishery management decisions in the future. Diet analysis is traditionally a visual process. You can look at a prey specimen and rely on taxonomic ID keys that require, to you, that require you to be able to recognize certain um, diagnostic features, um, which can be things like numbers of certain spines or fin rays, or maybe perhaps some unique pigmentation patterns. However, relying on visual keys can be quite a challenge for large piscivorous predators, and especially those that live in warm water and have high digestion rates. In fact, um, a metabolic study on gray snapper showed that fish prey are almost completely digested after only about three and a half hours. And so if you don't happen to catch a predator specimen within about three and a half hours of its most recent meal, then fish prey often look kind of like this, or at least I think these are fish. And actually one specimen that I thought was a fish wasn't even a fish at all, um, but actually a species of polychaete worm, which kind of just goes to show how difficult it really can be. Thankfully, there have been several recent studies that have shown that you can overcome these challenges 
by using DNA barcoding um, from a number of different species, including sharks, lionfish, catfishes, and even sunfish. So we thought, what the heck, let's give it a try too. You can think of DNA barcoding sort of as genetic fingerprinting. Certain segments of DNA are unique to every individual, but other segments of DNA are unique to all individuals of the same species. And so if we can find those segments, and if you have a database of known reference sequences in those segments, then you're in business. And so we began our study with three main objectives, that with increased taxonomic resolution from DNA barcoding, we wanted to identify the most important prey of red snapper, determine whether red snapper were specialist predators, eating just a few key species of fish, which can really quickly drive down prey populations, or generalist predators eating um, kind of a wider uh, diversity of different species of fish. We also wanted to evaluate red snapper dietary overlap with other predators of similar size and habitat that they may potentially be competing with for limited resources. Red snapper were collected by routine sampling of the Southeast Reef Fish Survey, or SURFS, which is a collaborative fisheries independent survey conducted by the Marine Resources Monitoring Assessment and Prediction Program, or MARMAP, out of SCDNR in Charleston, NOAA's Southeast Fishery Independent Survey, or CFIS, out of Beaufort, North Carolina, and the Southeast Area Monitoring and Assessment Program, or CMAP South Atlantic, um, also out of SCDNR Charleston. And whenever there's not a raging pandemic, um, sampling typically occurs annually from April through October, covering the area from Cape Hatteras, North Carolina to Port St. Lucie, Florida, over confirmed live and hard bottom habitat in depths ranging from about 15 to 135 meters. So it's quite a large sampling effort. The primary sampling gear that we used was the chevron trap, which was baited with Atlantic Menhaden. Um, but some samples were also collected opportunistically using hook and line. We used a size and area stratified sampling design um, to collect a wide range of the red snapper population. Um, so we had a maximum of 20 fish in each weight latitude bin um, who had prey in their stomachs that we wanted to retain for diet analysis. So super high tech tally sheet was used. Once we had a red snapper that met those criteria, the whole stomach was removed at sea, bagged and tagged and immediately frozen to inhibit further digestion. Then back in the lab, each stomach was thawed and all prey were carefully removed um, to avoid scraping any cells from either the stomach lining or any other prey inside. Everything was sorted by taxa, ID'd as best as we could visually, counted and weighed. And then um, we also assigned a digestion code um, ranging from one to four to assess the overall fish prey condition. Um, and so here's what those uh, digestion coding system looks like. Code one, uh, we're calling fresh, or you know, about as fresh as you can be after being eaten by another fish. In this condition, um, you still have usually the skin and all spines and rays you might need for counts. And so you can usually uh, get a species level ID in this case. Code two, um, this uh, condition is mostly intact, but the skin and the spines and rays are starting to erode and fall out. Um, occasionally you can get a species level ID in this condition, but more, than, more often than not, it's 
more of a, a genus or a family level ID that you can get. In code three, now it's just really digested. Um, essentially, you just have muscle tissue on vertebrae. And at this point, you can only really tell that it's just a fish of some sort. Finally, in code four, we just have hard calcified parts remaining, such as vertebrae or maybe otoliths. And in some cases, the otoliths are distinct enough that you can uh, recognize a species, but it's really difficult as well. Um, and I'll also point out that in code four, it was um, really inconsistent to get good DNA off of this, off of this um, condition. So for reference, here are the overall proportions for each digestion condition. You can see 5% of the prey were assigned code one, 7% code two, the majority at 71% were assigned code three, and then 17% were assigned code four. And so given that really only specimens in code one can usually be identified to species, this means that only 5% of the fish prey in this study would be able to be identified to species visually without the help of DNA barcoding. We found that um, DNA barcoding of invertebrate prey generally was not going to be as necessary. Sometimes they would be a bit too broken down to get an exact species. Um, but for the most part, since they have hard chitin exoskeletons, um, they're much more slowly digested and could usually be ID'd just visually. Um, here you can pretty clearly tell we have brown rock shrimp, uh, flame box crabs, mantis shrimp, long spine swimming crabs, and porcelain crabs. So these were only ID'd visually. And so when an unidentified fish that still had at least some muscle tissue uh, was encountered during visual examination, a small piece of tissue was removed from that fish, which was then rinsed with sterile water to get rid of any surface DNA, which might've either been from the predator itself or from other prey items that were also inside the stomach. And of course, all utensils were sterilized between prey samples to avoid any contamination. DNA was then isolated from those small pieces of tissue using a promega spin column method. Um, essentially, the tissue is being dissolved and the DNA is able to be filtered out. Next, we did PCR, which is just basically making a bunch of copies um, of a certain part of the DNA so that there's enough of it for sequencing. And that um, specific part of DNA we were targeting is a gene called cytochrome oxidase 1. And this location was chosen because it has a, a fast enough mutation rate that it can differentiate between closely related species, but it's also very conserved within a species. And also, um, CO1 is mitochondrial DNA. And one of the good things about mitochondrial DNA is it's really abundant within cells. So even for really highly degraded DNA, potentially that's been you know, digesting away in stomachs for days, you should still have a pretty high detection of DNA. This marker is pretty commonly used for similar studies as well. And so to that point, there are a lot of publicly available PCR primers like fish forward and fish reverse, which we used, and also a lot of reference sequences to compare with. PCR products were then shipped off to a company called Eurofins Genomics um, to have both forward and reverse DNA sequences produced for us. You kind of just move your PCR product over to a plate, add in your primers for sequencing, stick on a prepaid label and mail it out. And you receive a file a couple days later with uh, just a digital file with all your sequences in it. Once we get those sequences back, 
um, it's kind of a tedious process. Each one has to be opened up and viewed um, to check for any errors. Occasionally, due to certain factors like maybe low DNA yield or contamination, or even maybe an air bubble, um, the machine may not be able to tell for sure what the sequence is in a certain little stretch. So here, um, just kind of putting an N for unknowns that came back. Um, and that's why you really want to have both the forward and the reverse sequences, because each base only has one complement, right? Try to think back to general biology. A always goes with T, and C always goes with G. So if we have a problem with the sequence in one direction, here this is probably just um, uh, an issue early on in the sequence um, with the fluorometer. Um, and so you can see, as long as you have good clean sequence in the other direction, you can make the correction um, using the sequence and, and figure out those unknowns. So finally, um, coming up to the moment of truth, we have our clean edited sequence, and we're going to query it against the reference sequence database using NCBI's BLAST tool. So we just copy and paste in our sequence, hit the blast button, and then we wait while it's searching. Um, you know, your heart starts pounding, you're like, oh my gosh, what's it gonna be? And then finally, after what feels like hours, but really, you know, 15 or 30 seconds is all it takes, it finally spits out a list of the closest match to your sequence. Um, and so in this case, the top match is Hamulon Arolineatum, or Tomtate, at 100%. And um, we required a 98% species ID um, for to confidently assign a species. And so if the top match was below that threshold, like say the top match here happened to be this uh, Hamulon Flavolineatum at 92% instead, then um, we would just keep it conservative with either a genus ID or just even a family ID, kind of depending on what the rest of the matches look like. Um, okay, now just a little bit of math. I'll try to make this fast and not bore you all too much, but we did quantify the relative composition of the diet for each individual prey item using several common metrics. Uh, we did percent frequency of occurrence, or percent F, essentially what percentage of stomachs did the prey item occur in, and that's just the number of stomachs containing a specific prey item divided by uh, the number of total stomachs. Percent by number, which is just the total number of a specific prey item divided by the total number of all prey. Percent by weight which is just the total weight of a specific prey item divided by the total weight of all prey. And then finally, um, an index of relative importance, which um, is just kind of a more descriptive, meaningful way to combine all of these metrics. Okay, so now that that's over, um, let's get into some results finally. We collected 105 red snapper diet samples during the 2017 and 2018 sampling seasons from Georgia to North Carolina waters in depths ranging from about 23 to 72 meters. All of the boxes you see here on the map um, represent exactly where the diet samples were collected. And the light gray colored boxes are locations where DNA barcoded prey came from. So you can see we did barcode prey from a, a pretty wide range of area and depth as well. Our red snapper ranged in size from about 319 to 854 millimeters total length. We maybe had a few more smaller um, than larger individuals, which is probably pretty indicative pretty indicative of the overall population. And the average size shown by the dashed line here was around 500 millimeters. 
so here's kind of a, a very general view of the overall diet, um, just kind of from up in the cheap seats, according to the IRI metric. We can see that the most important overall prey type was shrimps, followed by fishes, and um, next, crabs. They also consumed cephalopods, which are squids and octopuses, stomatopods or mantis shrimps, amphipods, bivalves, copepods, polychaete worms, and tunicates. But these were these prey types were much less important in the overall diet. If we break this down a little bit and look at overall diet by size, we can see that smaller red snapper from about 300 to 500 millimeters are preying pretty heavily on fish and then a little less on shrimp and even less on crabs. Intermediate sized red snapper between 500 and 700 millimeters are a little more evenly spreading out their diet among fish, crabs, and shrimp. But now things like squid you can see are starting to become a bit more prevalent. And then at the largest size, over 700 millimeters, you can see fish and crabs are jumping way back up. Squids are still coming up a little bit, squids and octopuses. And then uh, shrimp drop out of the diet quite a bit at this size. We also wanted to explore differences in diet related to depth a little bit. Because changes in depth likely mean changes in habitat, and therefore likely changes in prey composition. One trend that we see here worth noting is that as we move into deeper waters, fish become less of an important prey, while shrimp become much more important. And you can see crabs kind of uh, tend to be relatively important prey consistently in all depths. Right, but what about the DNA barcoding, of course? Um, we were able to get usable DNA from about um, just under 90% of the unidentified fish samples using PCR. Um, some samples just didn't work out, and this was likely due to degraded or um, low yield of DNA initially, because most of those samples that didn't work were pretty late stage code three. And of those samples uh, that PCR did work for, again, just under 90%, um, um, just under 90% of these produced good clean sequences that we were able to assign to prey. So overall, we had 53 unidentified fish prey specimens that we tried to barcode. Um, we were able to identify 32 of these to species six to genus, and two of them we could only get to family. But in total, DNA barcoding allowed us to identify 19 unique fish prey species. And um, if we had only used visual methods, then we would really only have been able to identify two unique fish prey species, which is only about 10% of the total fish prey field that we found. And I'll also point out real quickly that the two most closely related prey, um, both in the same genus, had sequences that were around 19% dissimilar. And so that gives us a lot of confidence that our 98% threshold for species ID is plenty conservative against any false IDs. Here I'm gonna show you all of the different fish prey that we identified. Um, sorted by frequency of occurrence. Um, off the bat, the most frequently encountered um, fish species was the blue spotted sea robin in about 7% of stomachs. Around 4% of stomachs contained cusk eels, inshore lizard fish, and stenotomous species, um, which are either scup or long spine porgy. Um, there are just kind of some issues with both the reference sequences and the morphology of these two species that makes them really hard to tell apart and was just kind of too close to call for sure. Tomtate were found in about 3% of stomachs. 
and bantooth conger eels and striped codlets were found in about 2% of stomachs. Most of the other species were found in only about 1% of stomachs. Um, and it's interesting to me that so many of these species have kind of a really common body shape, right? Long and slender. You see a bunch of different eels, lizard fishes, wrasses, scad. It's kind of almost like they have developed some kind of a search image. Um, the only species that we identified that are currently under fishery management plans um, were red porgy, vermilion snapper, tom tate, and the stenotomous species. However, um, each of these species comprise less than 1% of the diet by weight, except for the stenotomous um, species, which was around 6% of the diet by weight. And now um, I'm showing you the top 10 prey taxa overall. Um, you can see we still have a fair amount of unidentified fish um, due to a lot of those prey specimens just being a little too far gone for barcoding. If you remember, about 17% of the samples were in that species code 4, um, where there wasn't really any tissue anymore, and we just had a hard time getting good DNA from those. Otherwise, you can see a red snapper really loved to chow down on rock shrimp, um, swimming crabs, several other shrimp species, and stomatopods. And again, they really love to see, um, they really love to eat blue spotted sea robins. They made it into the top 10. Again, um, like I mentioned, we do have a larger proportion of unidentified fish still than we would like, but DNA barcoding did help us to reduce this by 21% um, by frequency, 12% by number, and 9% by weight. One metric that is often used to determine whether or not sampling was sufficient to completely characterize the diet um, is what's called a prey species accumulation curve. To simplify this, it just sort of calculates um, what happens if I add another prey or another predator to my sample size? Would I expect to see any new prey that I haven't seen before? And um, when that curve goes flat or asymptotes, then the answer is no. And it's pretty uncommon for these curves to completely flatten out really, especially when you're sampling over such a large area like we did and for generalist predators like our data show red snapper to be. And prey that are missing from the curve are often rarely or even inadvertently consumed and tend to be a, you know, a really small part of the overall diet. So while our curve still is trending upward, um, you really want the slope to be more like 0 0.05 instead of 0 0.32 to be considered saturated. Um, however, we're still confident that um, we have characterized the bulk of the diet and shown the most important prey. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we were also interested in knowing how the diet of red snapper might overlap with other predators that it shares habitat with, and therefore may be competing with for limited resources, and also how DNA barcoding, as opposed to just visually identifying prey, might affect what that overlap looks like. And so we looked at just the fish prey of red snapper and also snowy, red, scamp, and gag grouper. And we calculated overlap using Shaner's index based on percent weight for each prey species and for each predator. And Shaner's index um, has a range from zero to one where zero would be no overlap at all and one would be complete overlap. And note that a value of 0 0.6 is considered biologically significant and would indicate potential competition if resources were limited. And so if we look at the Shaner's index in an overlap matrix using just what we found using visual methods of diet analysis, which you know is gonna include a lot of unidentified fish, 
then it looks like red snapper have biologically significant overlap with every one of these predators. Um, you can see that the overlap is especially high with both scamp and gag, well above 0.8. However, if you DNA barcode the fish prey for each of these predators and then recalculate the overlap indices, notice how those numbers drop off really sharply. And now red snapper does not overlap significantly with any of these predators anymore. And you can see the highest value is just 0 0.44, so about half of what it was previously. And so in summary, our study set out to identify the most important prey of red snapper, and we found that those are rock shrimps, fishes, swimming crabs, and squids. And DNA barcoding was an extremely valuable tool for us um, that greatly increased taxonomic resolution of red snapper fish prey and showed us that there's likely very little predation on any currently managed fish species. And we also did not really find much evidence for any particular prey resource to warrant any special management as an ecosystem component, um, except for, you know, maybe rock shrimp. We determined that red snapper are very generalist predators that in our study consumed 70 different prey taxa, including 19 different species of fish. So they're pretty unlikely to be having any strong direct predation effects on any one particular fish species. We also found that dietary overlap between red snapper and other predators of similar size and habitat is likely pretty low. Although we have shown that this estimate may be misleadingly high without the use of DNA barcoding. Moving forward, um, we still have a lot of work that we'd like to do in the future. Um, it would be great to be able to increase our sample size so that we can further decrease the unidentified fish percentage and encounter some of maybe the more rare prey species that. Um, maybe absent from our curve. And we'd also really like to be able to expand the range of this diet sampling. Um, this work was done as part of a master's thesis that focused not just on red snapper, but also several other species that I mentioned earlier. And so our sampling area was kind of originally chosen to maximize where all those species tend to co-occur more densely. And um, we'd really love to be able to expand diet sampling further south, um, especially with the DNA barcoding. Down into Florida, where kind of the center of abundance of the red snapper population lies. Um, just kind of a matter of tracking down the funding. Um, with that, I've got a lot of folks to thank. Uh, CMAP, MARMAP, and CFIS staff and um, for all assistance collecting and for funding. Um, Slocum Lunds Foundation was essential for funding and helped with our DNA barcoding costs. Um, the College of Charleston Thesis Committee, Dr. Tracy Smart, Dr. Tanya Darden, Dr. Marcel Reichert, and Dr. Gorka Sancho. The SCDNR Population Genetics Lab for assistance and the uh, College of Charleston's Molecular Core Facility as well. Um, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions anyone might have. Thank you for that, Kevin. If you don't mind, I'm going to take the screen back for just a bit so I can go over the uh, re-explain on how to raise your hand and ask questions. Sure. Handing it back to you. Thank you. Okay, so once again, uh, how to work this webinar. Um, right now, um, your microphone is likely red, indicating that you will not be able to speak. 
um, until you are unmuted by the organizer as well as unmuting yourself. So just click on that red button after you hear you've been unmuted by the organizer if you'd like to ask a question. And if you would like to ask a question, raise your hand. Um, when you raise your hand, uh, this little symbol will, will turn red. You'll see a red arrow up that indicates your hand is up. And then if you do not want to ask a question out loud, you can type it into the question box and I will read it out for you. And with that, we do have one question that, uh, one hand up right now, and it is Steve Poland. Steve, go ahead. All right, thank you, Chip. And thank you, Kevin. I, I really uh, enjoyed that presentation. And I've, I've got a fondness for, for diet studies and a lot of your techniques and terminology um, really sent me back down memory lane. So I, I do appreciate that. And it's certainly interesting work. Um, I did want to ask you about um, potential for um, seasonal variation in, in red snapper diet. I know surf survey, um, I think it occurs, I don't know, ballpark summer, in late spring, summer, maybe into early fall. Um, just in your opinion, do you think there may be um, any seasonal differences um, in red snapper diet? you know, maybe in the fall and winter? Um, and did you see anything um, during those summer and early fall months that might indicate that there might be some, you know, seasonal shifts in um, you know, um, predation of, of red snap by red snapper? Thanks, Steve. Um, good question. I did um, look at seasonal variation with a larger data set so for this, with only 105 samples, it's kind of difficult to pick out those trends. Um, but I did see differences in, it's you know, it's probably not likely an active choice by red snapper what they're eating, but prey composition does seem to differ a little bit seasonally. Um, and I'll, I have, we can talk offline a little bit more. I need to look back at that, but um, certain times of the year, crustaceans were much more dominant. Um, I think that's in the colder seasons. Um, and you also see some different fish prey coming into the scene. Like um, I mentioned um, in one of the opening slides, kind of seasonal migrations by fishes. And one kind of funny thing that I saw looking at, um, I think it was scamp diet when we were looking at all of these predators was Atlantic croaker were showing up in the diet, um, you know, which you wouldn't think that red snapper are going all the way in feeding off, you know, in the inshore waters. So I think that's a, a seasonal spawning thing where croaker came out offshore instead. Um, but yeah, there, there's some pretty subtle differences, but like I said, wasn't really be able to tell with this sample size, and that's something that we want to expand upon in the future. Yeah, All right. Thank uh, you, Kevin. Oh, sorry, Chief. I'll just uh, follow up. You know, just anecdotally, um, as far as Atlantic mm -hmm. croaker, um, at least up here off of North Carolina, it's more north of, of Hatteras, but it does occur some south of Hatteras. I mean, there is a fishery for Atlantic croaker that typically fishes out to you know, 40 or 50 fathoms. So, and that, that's mostly in the winter time. So it's not uncommon for croaker to be out there. So it right. really surprised me that much that, you know, red snapper and croaker might interact and it just provides another interesting uh, ecological linkage there to some more of our estuarine managed species. So thank you. Yeah, exactly. Thanks. Yeah, it was cool to see. All right. Jessica McCauley has her hand up, and then followed by Randy McKinley, and then Nikolai Koblansky. Thank you, uh, Kevin. Great presentation. Um, like Steve, I also have for um, diet studies, and I went so far as to pull my thesis off of the bookshelf and <laughs> open. Um, because I also worked on a diet and prey demand of red snapper, but mine was in the Gulf of Mexico, 
but I was uh, looking at your results and like Steve, I was going to ask questions about the seasonal variability. The other thing that I did um, in my thesis was look at kind of habitat type of the prey items, like was the prey in the water column versus sand and mud habitats? Did that change with the seasons? Um, so yeah, I was really interested to see if you had some seasonal variability there. I also looked at it by size class because at certain sizes and in certain seasons, uh, the prey type, just like you're mentioning, seemed to change uh, between not just species of fish, but in certain seasons and at certain sizes, they seem to be going after pelagic zooplankton, which was not exactly what I expected. Um, and then, as you mentioned, uh, in certain times of the year, more on uh, fish. But I also, like you, found lots of stomatopods in there and a lot of the same crabs that you found in these red snapper stomachs. I also found a lot of shame-faced crabs. So very interesting. I had similar results and uh, definitely took me back down memory lane. So thank you for the presentation. Thank you. All right, Randy McKinley, you should be unmuted if you want to unmute yourself. There you go. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, very interesting presentation. And uh, I guess just from the standpoint of a fisherman and stuff, looking at it, maybe a different angle is I know that, you know, maybe not a recommendation based on this for action for eco base, but, you know, I guess in maybe big Greece down in Florida and stuff, there's, there's sort of an unlimited amount of this food, but like on some of the areas we fish off mid-North Carolina, a lot of small rocks and stuff, you know, there's only a small portion, I guess, of food or, or whatever kind of variety it may be. And um, if they're aggressive and come in there and, and eat all that, then it doesn't really matter what their diet is if they, you know, if they sort of displace on the reef. And this is, I know it doesn't have anything to do with that study, but it's, I just think that would be another angle to possibly look into, if that makes sense. Yeah, thanks. Like I mentioned, it we would definitely like to get <clears throat> get down um, into Florida and do some, a little more extensive diet sampling for sure. All right, uh, Nikolai. Not hearing you quite yet, Nikolai. I see that you're unmuted, but we don't hear you. Speaking. Okay, we barely hear you. <laughs> so, um, okay. Oh, no, is that better? Yeah, it's a little better. Oh. If you want to type it into the question box, I could potentially uh, read it out for you. Okay, yeah, I apologize. I don't know why. Why? Uh, we, we're hearing you now, though. Oh, okay. Maybe I'll just be loud. Um, okay. <laughs> Let's try this. Okay, so my, my first question is actually I have two questions. If you can hear me well enough. Um, first question was about a plot where you're you're scaling species species richness by the number of stomachs. And um, I was wondering uh, if that's the standard versus the, I would think that you might scale by the number of individual fish or prey items that you identified the species. That's sort of standard for um, when you're like doing rarefied species richness calculation in you know, other animal studies that I'm familiar with. Kevin, if there's a slide that you would like me to go to, I'll, I'll bring up your presentation. I'm sure, uh, let me see. Toward the end. Yeah. That's not a plot. Should be try forty five. Is it this one? Yep, that's it. Okay. Yeah, so I don't know how much it would how much it would change it. And I mean like in if you're if you're sampling like a forest or something and you have quadrats and you're sampling bunch of bugs or something like that. You could use the 
number of quadrats on the x-axis or the number of individuals. I think it's preferable to use the number of individuals. I don't know how much it changes here, but it's just sort of like a different measure of effort. Um, I'm, I'm having kind of hard time here. So um, <clears throat> are you saying number of stomachs versus number of individuals? Is that the question? Or yeah, just saying, I wonder how it would vary if you were looking at the number of individuals. So like if you extrapolated out um, based on like a, a catch extrapolation, are you saying? Or so Basically, instead of looking at number of stomachs on the x-axis, you have number of individuals. So you might have stomachs where you caught, you know, Two, you identify two species, and then stomachs where you identify 100 species or something like that. And so that unit of measurement could vary a lot and, and sort of change the way that curve looks. Mm -hmm. Right. Now we didn't we didn't look at it that way, but um, it's definitely something to look into. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I don't know if it would make that much of a difference, but I know it it's, sometimes can make a difference. Yeah, just kind of based, you know. On, over such a wide area, <clears throat> I don't expect it to change a whole lot with such a you know a large changing prey field, especially you know over that area and over that length of season as well. Right. <clears throat> Can you hear me well enough to me to ask another question? If you say it really loudly. Okay. <laughs> my my other question is sort of sort of a comment, but I, you know, first of all, I should say I really enjoyed your talk and your your work. Um, but toward the end, one of the take home messages is that I'm not sure if I'm characterizing this right, but that red snapper seem to not be having much of an impact on fisheries species, um, and I might just be characterizing that wrong, but it seems like if you want to make that point that you need to sort of somehow uh, characterize the, the overall impact of the population on another population. So, you know, if you have a lot of red snapper and not very many of another of a particular prey species, even if they're not eating them that much, they might have a you know big impact. Yeah, that's correct. We didn't really, um, <clears throat> excuse me, didn't really look at the relative abundance of those prey in the area. Um, just kind of really trying to point out that, you know, of all this unidentified fish that we didn't know what it was that, you know, it's not all one particular species that, you know, is an, an immediate cause for alarm to think, you know, that as this population is really rebounding, that it's not completely decimating something else really obviously. Yeah, I think that I think that comes through in um, your, you know, diet composition tables that you showed, but um, just thinking sort of going forward, um, that would be interesting to somehow characterize that, even some kind of, you know, ballpark information. Right, exactly. Okay. Yeah, that's why we'd really like to continue doing it. Yeah, we do. All right, we had a question that was typed into the question box. Um, Brian Fleck had asked, did they break out diet preferences by depth or location? Uh, just curious if they noticed a substantial difference in the diet composition based on these variables. Um, we did by depth, if you want to jump back to 39. Okay, that should be pulled up. Yep, and so um, you can see, you know, and again, preference is kind of a a tough term. It It's likely not really a preference, but probably just kind of what's available as prey. And so you see kind of in shallower waters there, um, they're eating a lot of fish and that steadily goes down as you go deeper. And, and I think that's likely because sort of out in deeper waters, there's kind of a general trend that larger fish are out in deeper waters. And so probably not really available as prey any longer. 
most of the smaller fish that they'd want to be eating are probably a little bit shallower. And you see instead that um, shrimps are becoming a lot more important in the deepest waters greater than 60 meters. I hope that answers the question. Uh, unfortunately, he had to leave, so I'll, I'll reach out with your <laughs> response to him. Um, but I, I did find it pretty interesting that the, you know they are eating a lot of brown rock shrimp, um, especially off of the Georgia to North Carolina coast, when uh, the the bulk of the brown or uh, rock shrimp fishery occurs down off uh, Florida. Right. Any other questions? Uh, just raise your hand. Um, Rusty Hudson, I see you have your hand raised. You have been unmuted. There you go. Oop, you muted yourself, Rusty. There you go. You're unmuted okay, now. you can hear me now? Yes, we can. Cool. Uh, how many of the samples that are utilized in this particular analysis came off of like Northeast and Central Florida? Uh, for this study, we weren't able to sample in Florida. Um, if you want to go back to the map on 35. Yep, sorry if I missed that. Um, so for just the DNA barcoding, we were kind of um, limited a bit in that we were trying to kind of overlap with some of the other samples that we had for several species of grouper, and because we were really looking at comparing all those species together. And so our, initially we were keeping it um, in this region just to maximize that overlap. Um, okay, well, being from Daytona and the region that's the heart of Red Sapper country, it'd be great to be able to see some of this analysis applied you know, shoreward from state waters all the way out to uh, 360 foot. Uh, but we have a lot of Gulf Stream. We have a lot of other factors that, uh, you know, will affect the analysis because our, um, you know, it's like the porgy thing in the uh, idea of stuff that you know you had with some of the analysis i believe it's going to be a little different and it's going to depend on the seasonality uh you know and part of it's going to be affected by well if you're dealing just with uh, collections from whether it's hook and line or whether it's from uh the chevron traps chevron traps have more problems down on the end with the current. So I'm just trying to say that you could really expand on this analysis by including what you can find down here. And I noticed there was a idea that you needed to get some funding or something to make all that happen. Is that about right? Yes, sir. That's correct. Um, like I said, that's really one of our one of our um, future goals. We'd love to expand on there. Um, but yeah, it's definitely related to a little bit of funding. Yeah, because some of our big collections of uh, larger, older animals sometimes will move into areas and around structure that has not much around it. Uh, I don't know why it is, but it's usually in the uh, summertime. Uh, is that when most of your stuff was collected? Um, they would have been collected anytime between um, April and October. Okay, well, and that was chevron trap mostly analysis, or was it predominantly a chevron traps? Yeah, um, a few of these came from hook and line, and I did do some just kind of preliminary checks between those two, and there didn't seem to be much difference in composition. You wouldn't have a really. you wouldn't have a problem getting whole samples from various other fisheries besides chevron traps to be able to interact with this kind of analysis, I would think. Um, probably not, depending on um, how long those right. animals sit before we'd be able to get to them. Right. You know, like I mentioned, 
um, if they're sitting there, you know, digestion doesn't stop when the fish. No, dies. it would be a daily thing. Right. You know, so uh, you're able to get stuff on an hourly thing or whatever on the on the ship or whatever. Um, I would assume, or is that not correct? Uh, when CMAP collects the stuff from the Chevron traps, you have X amount of time that's already involved between the time it's caught, frozen, and you analyze it? Yes, that's correct. They're okay. pretty immediately put on on saltwater ice, but it may be, you know, a few hours before the before the dissections. Well, when I ran my shrimp boat, the saltwater ice maker was the cat's meow. So <laughs> <laughs> that that helps keep your stuff good. All yeah. right, thank you. All right, thanks, Rusty. All right, there's another question in the question box. How prevalent were lionfish in the diet of red snapper? Were there any other, uh, were there any species in the study that appeared to eat a relatively large amount of lionfish? We didn't see any lionfish um, in red snapper or any of the other species that we looked at. Um, if you... Slide 42 has all the species. Yeah, it would it would be nice if a bunch of these guys were helping to curb that population, but it just wasn't something that we saw at all. I will note that uh, Steve responded to uh, my comment that rock shrimp were also found in the diets of blackfin tuna and dolphin uh, in his research. Cool, yeah. I'm betting it's probably uh, it happens overnight because they tend to come up way up in the water column. We see them when we're sitting at the surface overnight with the lights on, they tend to, you know, congregate all around the boat. It's pretty neat, but I bet they're pretty easy pickings when they're just floating up like that. Rusty has his hand raised again. I meant to ask one question about black sea bass and bank sea bass. Um, I don't know where they show up in this uh, analysis. Thank you. Um, black sea bass, uh, we didn't find any. Um, we may have found one or two in one of the other predators, um, one of the groupers, um, but we didn't find any in the diets of red snapper. I guess that was brought up by the idea that when we would catch the small little black sea bass off of uh, Daytona with our penfish and we carry it out there as live bait, mm -hmm. uh, it would it'd be gobbled up. So uh, usually nice big red snapper, you know, the ones that are um, 10 to 25 pounds. Thank you. Kevin, this is Chip. I found this slide to be pretty interesting um, where you were comparing some of the um, higher level predators uh, on the on the reefs and looking at the, the overlap between them um, where just looking at the visual prey, you know, you saw very similar. And then when you got to the DNA barcode and you were seeing much different items, yes. but you did see significant overlap of a couple species or what I, I think is significant is the, the gag and the scamp as well as uh, red grouper and gag. Yes, there was, a, I was just kind of, ref, um, since the talk was about red snapper, just trying to focus it there. But yeah, we did still see, even with, um, after barcoding, um, I think gag and, gag and scamp, um, between the two of them were really highly preying on both tom tate and 
SCAD, round SCAD, I believe. Um, and same with red grouper. Thank you. All right, Lauren was um, answering a question, and Kevin's thesis, black sea bass were 2% of the scamp diet by weight, and bank sea bass were 4% of red grouper diet by weight. Thank you, Lauren. Yeah, thanks, Lauren. So like I said, um, yeah, like I mentioned to Rusty, it wasn't in Red Snapper, but, you know, a real smart, small part of of scamp and red grouper. Rusty, you and, have your um, hand up? It's kind of, uh, it, it may have, I think it, if I remember it was like one really large specimen. And so it can be, if you have one whole um, like black sea bass prey and you're comparing that to you know the weight of a bunch of small tissue pieces of other fish, it could potentially inflate that percent weight percentage for for even being a really infrequently consumed prey. Gotcha. Go ahead, Rusty, I see your hand is up again. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering if that sample was from up in the same region. It would have been, um, I can't tell you for sure right now, but it would have been still within this region from Georgia to North Carolina. With what was, uh, you know, remarked just before you said what you did. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Kevin's probably feeling like he's going through his uh, thesis defense again. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you want to jump to slide 53, I can try to clear up um, something for Rusty a little bit. So this is um, kind of the, showing the centers of distribution for uh, three species, red snapper, black sea bass, and red porgy. And um, so, right, you can clearly see the red snapper center of abundance is right there, you know, like everyone says, right off of Daytona. Um, but the black sea bass um, center of abundance is much more northward in the middle there. And, you know, from really from Georgia north. And so, like I said, we really, you know, really want to get down in Florida and sample a lot more, but I don't anticipate that um, we'd see a lot of them in the diets there if we're not seeing them in the diets in the northerly regions where black sea bass are much more abundant. Um, you know, but like I said, I don't know for sure, and we'd love to to be able to expand. Rusty? Well, yeah, it would be great. Um, you know, the Chevron traps run into the west wall of the Gulf Stream problem from Port Canaveral North, or actually south of there. <laughs> but uh it's just like sea map it, it kind of shuts down to just the very inshore edge below pond Inlet. so we're sort of the red-headed stepchild with all the red snappers here on Inlet. but uh back to little black sea bass and and the other things that they um the red snapper are found around depending on life stages and depths and uh, temperatures and other things like uh, the seasonality of some of what they eat. 
Uh, Scump was the thing that looks like a red porgy that was up on the north end there, and as far as your diet, so there's a little mixture there. But we have a lot of big red porgies out in the Aquilina area, and it's just you aren't going to be able to sap lid. It's just like this new Kitty Mitchell or Speckled Hind thing coming up. It's not going to get sampled right unless you're able to deal with that Aquilina stuff where the uh, bigger animals are. And with the red snapper, the bigger animals can be anywhere from five miles off the beach of Daytona, Ormond, St. Augustine, Port Canaveral, all the way out to 30 to 40 miles. And, and, and it gets crazy trying to be able to understand the feeding habits in those different regions, but they have them. And it's kind of neat to know. All right. Thanks. Uh, CMAP and all of them have all these different numbers. Uh, that I gave them. They, the problem is the Chevron trap has minimal ability to go to some of these areas where the Gulf Stream is. So thank you. Thanks, Rusty. All right. Any other questions? Give it another minute or two. Uh, just remember to click on the hand raise button if you'd like to speak, or you can type it into the uh, question box. All right, I am not seeing any other hands raised. Um, and no more questions. So, Kevin, thank you so much for your presentation today. I think it was very enlightening on the, the diet of Red Snapper. Um, and we really appreciate your time and all your hard work to, to get this done. And congratulations on fin finishing that master's thesis. Thanks a lot. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity to talk about it. Sure. Well, with that, uh, that's all we had for today. Thank you all for attending. Um, if you have any questions, please feel uh feel free to reach out to me. Um, you can contact me at chip.collier at safmc.net. Um, let me pull up a slide so you can see how to spell my name. It's down here at the bottom left of the screen. Oh, I paused the screen. My name is at the bottom left of the screen. If you have any questions, you can contact me and I'll forward your questions on along to Kevin. Or if you uh, just want to contact Kevin, you can reach out uh, to him as well. Thank you all, and have a great afternoon. Thank, Thank you, Chef. Thank you, Kevin. Kevin. Great job. Thank you.